Okay, by popular demand, we are going to do some more videos on reading hieroglyphs. Stay tuned and find out more about the Egyptian language on today's episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Today, we are going to talk about how transliteration works in Middle Egyptian. This video assumes that you've already watched the first 10 videos on reading hieroglyphs. Please watch those videos before watching this one. You'll find it a lot more helpful. And if you like these videos and wish to help the channel, please hit that subscribe button and leave a comment. It feeds the algorithm. And if you would like to support this channel financially, please consider supporting us on Patreon and perhaps purchasing my forthcoming book. Please use the affiliate link below. So far, we have covered the uniliterals, which are the alphabetic characters that represent the basic building blocks of the writing system. However, as you learn to read ancient Egyptian, you are going to encounter even more biliterals and triliterals. These are letters that represent two and three sounds respectively. And we're going to introduce these as we go along because there's a lot of them. So I'm not expecting you to know them all ahead of time, but do be cognizant of the fact that they are going to pop up from time to time and perhaps keep a notebook. Keep a notebook of this new vocabulary and of these new bi and tri literals because you'll find that very, very helpful. And even more than biliterals and triliterals, what we're going to also encounter is a lot of determinatives. And determinatives are really, really important in ancient Egyptian. And unlike triliterals and biliterals, determinatives have no pronunciation. They act as visual crib notes or hints to help you determine the meaning of the word. Now, redundant characters are frequently used in Egyptian. This is important when we transliterate words. So let's take a few examples. Here we have a word that has three uniliterals and one triliteral. We have a round H, a dung beetle, which is a triliteral that has the letters the round H, a P, and an R. And then after the dung beetle, it is followed by two uniliteral characters, a P and an R. But we don't read this as K, Keper, Pear. Instead, adjacent letters merge into each other. The round H merges into the triliteral, and so does the final P and R. This just leaves a reading of Keper. And this is the word that means to create. Okay, let's try a more complex example. In this example, we have three uniliterals, a biliteral and a determinative. The word begins with an S. The bird, a swallow, is a biliteral that represent, is represented by the letters WR. By the way, these letters are only read in one direction. So the swallow is always read as WR, not RW, and not just R, and not just W. Under the bird, we have an R, which is followed by an I character. The final glyph is a determinative, a seated man holding his hand to his mouth. This character has no pronunciation, but is used for words dealing with eating and drinking. And again, we don't read this as S where R I. The R coalesces into the biliteral. But we also have to deal here with a special rule. If you see a word that ends in R I like this, it is an indication that we are dealing with a weak R. In ancient Egyptian, final R's are weak. 
The addition of the I shows that the R is not vocalized. So this word, which means to drink, is translated as sewer, but is actually pronounced as suey. So the R is silent and replaced by the I. Okay, now we have another word, which doesn't have any uniliterals at all. It is possible in ancient Egyptian for a word to consist of just biliterals or triliterals. And here we have a biliteral and a determinative. The first character is an inkwell and a brush, and is pronounced sesh. S and a sheen. The determinative is that of a seated man, and indicates that the word represents a person. This word means a scribe. But standard Middle Egyptian doesn't use articles, so this can also mean a scribe, the scribe, or just scribe. But let's say we want to change the determinative. Instead of using a person determinative, we use a scroll. This changes the meaning of the word. It's still pronounced as sesh, but now it means a document or writing. This is why determinatives are so important in ancient Egyptian. And that's because ancient Egyptian contains a lot of homonyms. Words that sound the same, but mean different things. In spoken ancient Egyptian, context would help you figure out which is the right word. But in writing, you need a little help. So the determinative is there to help you know which meaning is being referred to. Now, all this I think should seem pretty straightforward. However, like every language, there are exceptions in hieroglyphs. The word being shown right now is not translated ITF. The uniliteral F, the horned viper in this word, is not actually a uniliteral, but it is a determinative. This is the word eat, and it means father. And it is a very, very common word in ancient Egyptian. So you have to know it's pronounced eat. We have a lot of similar examples of silent letters in English. It's, for example, in English, it is chorus, not cohorus. Gnome, not gnome. Lamb, not lamb. And sword, not sword. Well, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.